Rifkin. And uh, so our uh, first speaker in this, uh, in this session is uh, Christian Joas, a uh, longtime uh, member of the, uh, of the Berlin Quantum Group, spent some time in Munich, and is currently in t, uh, at uh, the Niels Bohr's Bohr archives in, uh, in Copenhagen. And he's going to talk to us about post-war theoretical practice quantum many-body physics in the 50s. Christian. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, so yeah, today I'm going to uh, be speaking about uh, many-body physics in the 1950s. Of course, I'm not claiming that it is a field that only appeared in the 1950s. And after what Jean-Philippe has told us uh, in the talk before, this would be ludicrous in a way. So uh, I'll jump right in because I want to get through my first slides rather quickly to have some more time for some case studies that I'm going to present towards the end of my talk. So. In 1961, David Pines, one of the protagonists and promoters of many-body physics, states in a book that is a textbook and also at the same time a reprint volume of the most important papers, as he sees it, um, the recent developments in the many-body problem have tended to change it from a quiet corner of theoretical physics to a major crossroad. And that was my mistake, I guess. Here it is. Um, so, what are many body systems? By now you should have a good idea. For instance, uh, the nucleons in a nucleus, um, molecules in a liquid, electrons in a metal, or the atoms in a molecule. And of course, you could also think about much more older um, problems like the number of angels on a pinhead. Until the 1950s, you had simple one particle, mean field, or Hartree Fock models, or you could attempt to start like from first principles, namely from the many-body Schrodinger equation that I wrote down here, uh, actually copied here. Um, this would be for a molecular system. And it, the problem is it's solvable in principle, but it's not solvable in practice due to the large number of interacting particles. In the case of Coulomb interactions, these interactions are very long-ranged. So uh, good luck trying to attempt and solve this for, say, 100 particles you will not succeed. Uh, since the mid-1950s, many-body many body perturbation theory is being used. New schemes are developed uh, that uh, use methods borrowed from quantum electrodynamics, for instance, Feynman diagrams. And the advantage of these methods is that they yield controlled approximations. So you can actually estimate what mistakes you're making while calculating things. And it also greatly reduces the complexity of the calculations involved. My outline looks as follows. Um, at first, I want to look at many-body physics and the diversification of physics that was happening right like after World War II in the 1950s. Then I want to make some brief comments on many-body physics and knowledge transfer within physics. And then I will present a number of case studies. We'll see how many I will have time for. And then there will be a conclusion and some questions. So let's start with the diversification of physics. In the post-war, physics as a discipline grew tremendously. You see a plot here of the number of physics PhDs uh, per year in the United States by Dave Kaiser. And you see there is a huge surge after the war due to the increased prestige of physicists and due to many other factors, due to a general growth in science. And this, of course, increased the specialization of physicists. Uh, physics diversified into subdisciplines, and there was a general feeling around among physicists that this led to a balkanization of physics, that the practices of physicists were diverging, that it became more and more difficult to talk to a physicist from another specialty. Say, a nuclear physicist talking to a solid state physicist would be something that still worked in the 50s, but that might not work anymore in the 60s or 70s if this process went on. So how did these subdisciplines of physics come about? In the, like from 1900 to the 1920s, you have quantum physics, atomic molecular physics uh, showing up as a like, discernible specialty in physics. Nuclear physics emerges during the 1930s. Think of like the anus mirabilis of nuclear physics. Um, in the 1940s, from nuclear physics, a very definite set um, of uh, people and methods is more or less pl split off. And you have the first signs of like the institutionalization of a subdiscipline that discerns itself from nuclear physics uh, and calls itself elementary particle physics. And during the late 40s, we've just seen the example of Slater's group at MIT, 
or early 50s, you have solid state physics emerging as a social entity on the scene of physics. This little uh, picture here is arranged in a way that it shows like the increasing complexity, the idea being that you, if you understand everything about elementary particle physics, well then you can understand something about nuclei. As soon as you figure out the physics of nuclei, you can build up in a constructive way your atoms and later your molecules. And if you understand molecules well, well then it's not very far anymore to understand what is happening in solids. So this is what is usually referred to as the reductionist account of physics and we just spoke about that actually. Um, so many body physics emerges during the 1950s and the question is, where does it go in this scheme? And my suggestion would be it goes here. It's like something that overlaps with basically all these other areas or specialties of physics. And the reason is that all these areas have a shared interest in many body systems at the time. And I want to look at a quote from one of the protagonists of this development, uh, Philip Anderson. It's actually a quote from 1984, but I think it transports nicely something that you can find in many other sources of other physicists too at the time. I'll read it to you. In 1947, when I started my thesis research on pressure broadening of microwave spectra, I had not the faintest appreciation that what I did might come to be called many body physics or that the methods I was about to use were soon to become part of the routine apparatus of a new field. Those of us who were doing this kind of thing thought of it either as statistical mechanics or as part of the new fields of chemical physics, like my work, or solid state physics. Since the 1950s, a quiet revolution has taken place in the methodology and in the confidence with which we approach this subject, of which a very definite but hard to define area has come to be known as many body as opposed to nuclear solid state or low temperature physics. A revolution has also, we should hope, come in our predictive success as well. This success is based upon a much more rigorous habit of thought combined with a much more complete arsenal of ideas and methods than were available then. And then he makes a few sentences about these ideas and methods, and the most central to him is especially like the many body perturbation theory using Feynman diagrams. But even Anderson shies away from calling this field of research a subdiscipline. He, uses the words new field, subject, hard to define area. This field emerges as a field of research just as the subdisciplines of physics begin to consolidate and the practices begin to diverge. It shows intellectual integration. Anderson uses the words rigorous habit of thought, arsenal of ideas and methods. So it's something where you could expect that an actual like institutionalized subdiscipline forms but it actually lacks this social integration. It stays institutionally fragmented. Physicists participate in something that you could call a many-body community, but they choose, in most of the uh, cases, to stay committed to the backgrounds from which they have come. So they stay nuclear physicists, they stay solid-state physicists, they stay particle physicists. It therefore never really reaches a subdisciplinary status, despite all the usual signs for institutionalization, like conferences, textbooks, meetings, and so on, chairs. A potential reason for that, I suspect, is that it is not organized around a class of phenomena, but around a shared set of methods. So it doesn't fit into this layering of the um, subdisciplines of physics that I've shown you, from elementary particle physics to solid state physics, but is somehow orthogonal to that layering, because uh, it treats not phenomena, but methods. Let me now quickly um, make a few comments on many body physics and knowledge transfer. So I've shown you this picture already. There's a shared interest in many body system. And this suggests that it's an ideal context for transfer of knowledge between the subdisciplines of physics at a time where supposedly they turned monolithic, as I like to call it, like where they uh, get a life of their own and do not look left or right anymore into other subdisciplines of physics. So indeed, during the 1950s, many body physics brings together actors from different backgrounds and becomes such a context for knowledge transfer. And something that I will not at all go into in my talk here, 
uh, but that is really important to understand the full history of that field is it also becomes a context for knowledge transfer between East and West, especially between the United States and Soviet Russia, where sometimes um, the developments in the field of many body physics actually happen in parallel and from about the mid 1950s onwards there's a lot of interaction between theorists from both sides of the Iron Curtain. So I would like to suggest that this happens because it is not organized around a class of phenomena. It counteracts the divergence of practices and if you look at statements of actors it seems like a conscious endeavor actually at establishing a modus operandi within physics that resembles at least what these people thought was the modus operandi of physics before World War II. Like the good old days of quantum mechanics, all these people talk to each other all the time. We don't do that anymore. Why don't we start doing that again? That's the like, rationale in many of the actors. So this term, knowledge transfer, might suggest to some of you a static picture. Knowledge floats freely through the air. It's like transferred linearly in immutable chunks from one context to another. This is not what I intend to say. Quite to the contrary, knowledge transfer involves people, not abstract fields, and it transforms the knowledge that is being transferred and affects the practices of those taking part in these processes of knowledge transfer. That's something important to keep in mind, and I will come back to that later. Um, so in the early to mid-1950s, the knowledge is mostly transferred from quantum electrodynamics to many-body theories of nuclei and solids. And this is probably a superfluous transparency. We heard a lot about QED, so it's a relativistic quantum field theory for explaining the interaction between radiation and matter. I refer to what happened before the renormalized QED as early QED. In 47, Beta explains the lamp shift using a cutoff. This lays the foundation for renormalization, and then you have Schwinger, Tomonaga, Feynman, Dyson, and others working this out. QED comes with new concepts, like that of renormalization, and that of the QED vacuum, concepts like pair production, vacuum polarization, vacuum fluctuation, and it also comes with new methods. Canonical transformation techniques, already present in like early QED, propagators, green functions, Feynman-Dyson perturbation theory, here to the bottom left, uh, right. I'm quite surprised nobody showed it so far. It's the, the very first ever published um, Feynman diagram from Feynman's 1949 paper. So QED brings about like a whole array of concepts and methods and like conceptual adv advances and methodological advances. In nuclear and solid state physics, the strong nuclear interactions or the long range Coulomb interactions prohibit a straightforward application of perturbation theory. It led to divergences in many cases, but please keep in mind that these divergences are of a very different nature than the ones you resolved with renormalized QED. Many body physics can be seen as an endeavor to render the concepts and methods developed within QED fruitful also in the context of interacting many-body systems. Many new schemes are developed for treating these interacting many-body systems. Often empirical knowledge is crucial in devising these schemes, and you will see how in my case studies. And over the course of the 1950s, a new heuristics emerges. The idea is that you map systems of strongly interacting particles onto fictitious new systems of non-interacting or merely residually interacting particles through the use of either effective field theories and or theories of collective behavior. And sorry for rushing through these first transparencies, but now I want to come to my case studies and I want to have a little time for that because I'm really looking forward to like comments and uh, questions on these. So this is the list of case studies. You see it's an impressive task that I set myself here. I'm probably not going to make it through all of them. Let me start. Uh, with a very short case study on the quantum electrodynamical vacuum and the many-body ground state of odd A nuclei, odd mass number nuclei. In 1951, the Japanese physicist Hironari Miyazawa tries to explain the magnetic moments of odd mass number nuclei. Experimentally, there were like deviations observed from the predicted magnetic moments, and uh, he was interested in making a theory for that. And guided by his teacher Tomonaga at Tokyo University, 
he acquaints himself with the very recent Feynman Dyson perturbation theory. And he manages to establish an analogy between the QED vacuum and the many nuclear ground state. Of course, this is nothing new for physics, but it is something new for Miyazawa, and that's quite important in this story. So the analogy essentially goes back to Dirac's whole theory as taken up and reinterpreted by Feynman in his 1949 papers. Let me just allude to how this analogy looks. Here on the left, you see a sketch of uh, Dirac whole theory, the theory in which you have these negative energy electrons, and the left most um, spectrum uh, you could uh, interpret as like the ground or also vacuum state of a quantum electrodynamics. And uh, you see an excited state here where like one of the negative energy electrons gets promoted uh, to a positive energy into an empty state there and leaves an empty state, a so-called hole uh, in uh, the band of neg negative energy states. And the analogy now is to uh, the Fermi gas, if you will. Um, so you have the ground and the excited states of a many fermion system, the Fermi gas, and the ground state, all the states are filled up to the Fermi level in an excited state. Um, you have some states above the Fermi level that are uh, ex where, where electrons are excited to or fermions are excited to and some holes below the Fermi level. Um, so Miyazawa now states in his 1951 article, a free nucleon is in reality immersed in the sea of negative energy nucleons. A nucleon bound in a nucleus is thus soaked in the negative energy sea and the Fermi gas. Therefore, the magnetic moment of the bound at nucleon can be calculated as if it were free with a proviso that now vacuum should mean vacuum plus Fermi gas. Using this redefinition, in a way, of the vacuum state and the tools of QED, uh, he predicts a deviation of the magnetic moment from the two possible values, J equals L plus or minus one half, predicted by Theodor Schmidt already in 1937. And this explains why the observed values of the magnetic moments of odd nuclei deviate from the Schmidt lines. So you can basically, for nuclei with a given total angular momentum, you can plot two lines, one is L plus, minus, plus one half, the other one is L minus one half, and plot all nuclei that you have there, and you see that they do not all lie on these lines, but deviate rather strongly sometimes from these lines. And this is like an attempt at explaining this deviation by Miyazawa. This little story, this first case study, constitutes a successful transfer of methods from quantum electrodynamics to the many body system of a nucleus. The many nuclear ground state can be treated like the QED vacuum, and this is induced by exchanges with Tomonaga at the University of Tokyo, who had just returned from a stay with Oppenheimer in Princeton. And this is just proof for uh, the role of uh, Yamanuchi, Tomonaga, and Kotani uh, in the story of this paper, which is very little known, and it's certainly not the only one doing this step. It's a very straightforward step at the time, but I wanted to show you one instance where uh, something like this is undertaken. My second example is very similar, but now this doesn't happen in nuclear physics, but in solid state physics, if you will, more exactly in superconductivity. In 1952, the Pakistani physicist Abdus Salam works on quantum electrodynamics and goes to Bombay to see Wolfgang Pauli, who is visiting. And in Bombay, he meets Kundan Singhwi, who had just returned uh, to India after working with Piles in Birmingham and Bardeen at Urbana. Singhwi tells Salam about the new model for superconductivity by Herbert Fröhlich. And Salam improves Fröhlich's formulation of the model applying new methods of quantum electrodynamics to the problem of electrons interacting with lattice vibrations in a superconductor. This is something quite important on the way towards the eventual resolution of the uh, enigma of superconductivity in 1957 by Bardeen, Cooper, and Schriefer. Salam writes, Fröhlich has recently developed a theory of superconductivity in which the superconducting behavior of metals arises from an interaction of two fields, the field of free electrons in the metal and the field of the lattice vibrations. The general study of interacting fields, that's uh, what he refers to when he means QED, has made great progress recently, and it seems worthwhile to write Fröhlich's theory in a form in which the newer, powerful methods can be applied to it. 
Salam introduces propagators, screens functions, and uses an analogy similar to Miyazawa's between the QED vacuum and the many body ground state or Fermi state of an interacting many electron system in a like second quantized formalism. Uh, here is a quote. This decomposition of Psi of X allows us to consider the Fermi state F as the reference state having in fact the same role as the vacuum state in the relativistic theory of electrons and positrons. Thus, U2 star of X can be interpreted as creating a hole in the Fermi state and U2 X as an annihilating a hole. This is another case of a successful transfer of methods from quantum electrodynamics to a new domain, in this case, superconductivity. It's, encounter, uh, it's induced by this encounter with Kundan Sigui and uh, Dirk Terha, an avid observer of many body physics and actually contributor of many body physics throughout the 50s and 60s and a very singular person because he was able to read Russian also, uh, comments uh, on this paper as follows, he says, Salam's paper probably for the first time applies green function techniques to solid state many body problems. My third case study is about Feynman diagrams and nuclear structure. Ariana today told us about uh, Feynman diagrams in meson theory and uh, throughout like the first half of the 1950s, Feynman diagrams slowly creeped into also the question of nuclear structure under what is eventually uh, come to be known as Bruckner theory. Um, so what is the state of affairs in the early 1950s? A quote from a paper by Vika Weisskopf. Since there exists no exact theory of nuclear structure, one is forced to introduce a number of oversimplified nuclear models in order to explain the main features of the experimental material. The models can be classified into two distinct groups according to their fundamental viewpoints. A, the independent particle viewpoint, IP, and B, the strong interaction viewpoint, SY. The two viewpoints seem to be totally contradictory. So the strong interaction viewpoint, that's basically the liquid drop model that explains fission, Bohr and Wheeler, and also accounts successfully for most nuclear binding energies. The independent particle model is the sh very recent shell model just introduced like two years earlier, uh, and that exhibits an analogy to atomic shell structure and explains the abnormally large binding energies of magic number nuclei, which are analogous in a way to inert gases like helium or uh, others. So Weisskopf's idea now is that these two models do not necessarily compete with each other, but that they might rather complement each other. And uh, he argues for this using an analogy to solids. And I'll read that to you. It may be useful to discuss in this connection an analogous situation that one finds in the theory of the electron motion in solids. The electronic properties of metals and insulators can be described very successfully by assuming that the electrons move in a common potential field of the ions. The interaction between the electrons is completely neglected. The electronic states in the lattice field exhibit also a kind of shell structure, the Briouin zones. And an insulator may be called a magic crystal for which the shells are completely filled. The success of this description is perhaps also surprising in view of the fact that the interaction between electrons is by no means small. Of course, this is only part of his argument for the compatibility or complementarity of these two very different models, the liquid drop or compound nucleus model on the one hand and uh, the uh, independent particle or, uh, yeah, well, the independent particle or shell model of the nucleus. Um, his argument is quite interesting, uh, turns around mean free paths actually between scattering events both within nuclei and uh, within solids, but I won't have time to go into this. Um, in the, 19, in the early 1950s, Auger Bohr, the son of Niels Bohr in Copenhagen, later joined by Ben Mottelson, sets out to develop a unified model combining the features of both these models simultaneously. In a series of papers in 52, 53, they introduced so-called collective variables describing the vibration and rotation of the nucleus as a whole. They establish a formal analogy to quantum electrodynamics especially to the treatment of the lamp shift within QED, and study the mutual coupling between the collective modes, which here are the surface oscillations of the nucleus, and the individual nucleons. So they imagine like they have one outermost nucleon interacting with um, like a compound nucleus model type um, uh, oscillating, vibrating, uh, breathing um, 
remaining nucleus. The bohr mottelson approach very quickly becomes commonplace in nuclear structure theory. And to show you how commonplace it became, at least in Copenhagen where it was done, I want to show you something uh, from the so-called Journal of Jocular Physics produced uh, for uh, Niels Bohr's 70th birthday. It's a form um, that um, supposedly everybody who writes a paper on nuclear structure from now on can just fill out instead of writing a paper himself. It looks like this. This is the standard form. Um, the title would be on the, and now comes blah, blah, something, in the unified model. There's a few authors. And then you see the buzzwords, interacting nucleons, collective motion, individual particle motion. And they also assume that um, most of the relevant uh, references will have appeared in the communications of the Danish Mathematical Physical Society. So this is a pun, of course, on how commonplace this has become by the mid-1950s. On a 1953 conference trip to Japan, Brückner, who we heard about today from Ariana, meets Fukuda, who asks him on a train trip about the consequences of the Brückner-Watson meson theory, formulated in terms of Feynman diagrams, for the saturation of nuclear forces in nuclear structure. Basically, why are there these um, magic nuclei? And in 1953 to 55, Brickner starts working on this and rewrites the many-body Hamiltonian. And he does it in the following way. He takes the Hamiltonian and rewrites it as like a shell model Hamiltonian, an exact shell model Hamiltonian, plus a perturbation, of course, assuming that nuclei will be very close to the shell model, but not exactly uh, the shell model. And then um, at first, he tries to do just normal perturbation theory for that and fails. So Actually, an interaction with John Bardeen leads him to using Chu Goldberger rather than standard Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation theory. And uh, he succeeds in formulating a theory, which is a tremendous improvement over Hartree Fock for the case of nuclear uh, structure, because all interactions between pairs of particles are now included exactly, and not just the uh, interaction between one particle and the smoothed out, smoothed out uh, potential of all the other particles. Um, this turns into what later uh, Bruckner in a paper in late, like in the second half of 1955 calls the so-called linked cluster expansion, which is a general scheme for strongly correlated many particle systems, not just for nuclear structure, uh, developed further by uh, the people I list here, and soon formulated with Feynman diagrams uh, of the type that you see here to the right by Goldstone and Hugenholz and others, Beta also. Uh, so this constitutes a successful transfer of concepts and techniques from QED, leading to a full-fledged many-body perturbation theory that would be very influential for uh, years to come. Now I come to my fourth. 17 minutes. 17 minutes, thank you. Uh, case study. Um, this is, so, uh, sorry, I should say it. It's uh, about Feynman diagrams in solids now, many-body theory for solids. Uh, again, collective coordinates and something that will be called gelman brückner theory. After the Manhattan Project, the American physicist David Bohm works on plasmas and solids. In 1948, he participates in the Pocono Conferences, where Schwinger presents his work on quantum electrodynamics. During Schwinger's talk, Bohm later claims that he realized that charge screening in many electron systems is analogous to renormalization in QED. So this is what he says in an interview with uh, Lillian Hodgson. Charge screening is really basically the same as renormalization in elementary particle theory. You see the actual charge on the electron is infinite, according to that theory, but it surrounds itself with a cloud which makes it finite. So this is a depiction of that. Charge screening means that an electron, here painted red, um, pushes away due to the Coulomb interaction the other electrons in the area. Since the background is charged uh, uniformly, positively, this creates a correlation hole around uh, the electron which is effectively charged positively and shields the negative charge of this red electron here away so that the electron is basically not seen anymore by, outer, uh, by electrons that are farther away because it now moves along with a cloud of positive charge. And this is very analogous. Bohm claims to have understood already at Pocono to the situation of like vacuum polarization in QED, where you have uh, particle-antiparticle pairs shielding away the charge of the electron. Um, 
Based on this insight, Bohm and his student Pines in 49 to 53 develop a collective model of interacting many electron systems, apparently independently of Bohr and Modelson. They use a complicated series of canonical transformations and show microscopically how the coupling between individual particles and collective modes, so-called plasmons, leads to charge screening and to an effective, like, reduced interaction between the electrons. This explains the puzzling success of single electron models despite the long-range Coulomb interaction between the electrons and is the first full-fledged many-body theory for solids, yet it does not have Feynman diagrams and it is not based on recent uh, QED, and I thank Alex Bloom for pointing that out to me. Um, so in 1957, Bruckner and Gelman uh, come together, meeting like during a RAND corporation meeting. I'm not going to read you this quote now, but they reformulate this theory using Feynman diagrams, and this is a very successful transfer. It's extremely influential and leads to a veritable flurry of developments already in 57 and even more so in 58 and 59. So instead of now going into these other two case studies, uh, I will just quickly tell you the one main feature that is uh, different uh, here about spontaneously broken symmetry and renormalization group. It is not any more transfer of knowledge from QED to nuclear or solid state physics, but to the contrary, it's a transfer of knowledge where models that have been developed within solid state physics or within nuclear physics are transferred back into the domain of elementary particle physics. That's the main structural feature of these stories. And please forgive me for just skipping these slides now. Um, it's anyway just two and come to my conclusion. Many body physics emerges during the 1950s as a field of research just as the subdisciplines of physics begin to consolidate. So, it looks like a conscious attempt of actors at maintaining the unity of physics as the practices begin to diverge. But this is, in a way, still an open research question to me, and I would be interested in what you have to say about that. Um, many body physics was centered around methods, not around a class of phenomena. This is certainly key in making it a potential arena for knowledge transfer within physics, but it also seems to be detrimental to the institutionalization of the field as a subdiscipline. This transfer of knowledge is not direct, it's not simple, it's not fast. The concept and methods have to be adjusted, reinterpreted, or even developed anew, and the existing models for many body systems have to be revisited and extended. And initially, the concepts and techniques are mostly transferred from QED to many body theory of solids and nuclei, and this is somehow reversed during the latter half of the 50s and especially the 60s and ever since. So you have like a bi-directional transfer of knowledge, something that Nambu called cross-fertilization. And one suspicion I have, although this is like really uh, just a suspicion at the moment, is that the easier experimental accessibility of solids and nuclei uh, might be responsible for the abundance of uh, the emergence of novel concepts in these two fields as opposed to uh, elementary particle physics. Thanks for your attention. Okay, we got uh, we got ten minutes, Alex, and then Martin. Uh, okay, I'll leave all. Okay, so I uh, thank you very much. That was um, uh, very very rich. I've got the two questions which are which are more general, and I think I'm, I have a very small specific question also, just because mm -hmm. I think that's also what you want to hear more. But I still have yeah. some general ones. The first is why in that first picture of the uh, of, of the fields, many particle physics takes part in this many body physics, because I don't really see that it, it seems that also all of your, um, all of your description seems to imply that this many body physics is a field where nuclear physics people and uh, solid state people talk, but the borrowing, borrowing methods from elementary particle physics, but the element, elementary particle physics is not really taking part there. But I just want to ask, yeah, that, that's my first question. Um, I'm not sure I got it so right. The so you, just why, you're referring to this picture. Yeah, and why, why is elementary particle physics part of this many body physics community? That seems a bit surprising yeah, to me. No, well, I mean, for sure it is in a way because, of course, many of the protagonists during the 1950s considered themselves elementary particle physics also because they do nuclear physics too. 
right? I mean, if okay, you, but but then that, that's just if you look at beta, for instance, that's just because elementary particle physics isn't yes. distinct from nuclear yeah. physics yet. So that's so, our, our, our so the answer would yeah. be why is it also yeah. overlapping there? It's because of the later processes that I didn't get to that I somehow drew it okay. uh, in an overlapping way. I agree with you. This is questionable. Okay, then this the second question I have is so in this large set of case studies you have, it seems like. Mm -hmm. uh, the new covariant renormalized QED is like this uh, buffet where the, uh, the people doing many body physics pick and choose, like, oh, I'm going to have the QED vacuum today for my paper, mm -hmm. and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick out Feynman diagrams. Can we see any kind of um, universality or general trend in this transfer of methods from, from QED mm -hmm. um, to many body physics in this period that emerges, or are we just have a very, very conceptually and methodologi methodologically rich theory which just provides many different kinds of, 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 uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of insights to, uh, to another emerging field which doesn't yet have that, yeah. Y yes, I mean, my, my case studies uh, are like scattered all around so that this probably is just hidden uh, from sight uh, here. Yes, you can do a periodization of like which parts of quantum electrodynamics seem to have been like more attractive at certain points and which uh, then only later became more attractive. So one thing you can say is that early on, like uh, dur during the early 1950s, mostly methods of quantum electrodynamics that are not new with renormalized quantum electrodynamics are being used. So for instance, canonical transformation techniques, they're used very much. Basically, if you take Wenzel's book, when is that 1937 or so, a lot of 40. the stuff, or 40-something, uh, is already in that book that people use. So they see that QED is somehow important and new, but they do not read Feynman or Dyson or Schwinger and Tomonaga, but they go back to like older quantum electrodynamics and use that as a like resource. And then... Uh, from about 53, 54 on, especially with nuclear physicists who have, of course, their share in the development of QED, um, thinking about nuclear structure, you have also Feynman diagrams and other things um, like slowly entering the field. And I would say that the role of nuclear physics is actually more important uh, than the role of solid state physics when it comes to that. All right. I'm going to have to cut it yeah. off because there's, there's eight more minutes. So it's Martin. Let me read you the, the cue. So it's Olival, Elise, Ariane, and then Tiago if we make it. So please be brief and yeah, please yeah, answer I will, brief. I will also yeah. be brief. Well, my, my, my question concerns the conclusion, so if you could go to the last slide again, that would be good. It's just 63 slides. So yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, nah. no, damn it. I went too far. Okay. So I'm very sympathetic to what you're uh, telling us here. Um, my question concerns this um, conscious attempt and at a unity of physics. Mm -hmm. um, and the, that you say that it's the methods which are central and not the problems. From the case studies which you showed us, it appeared that the initial motivation for, this phys for these physicists were the problems which were addressing, and mm -hmm. that is sort of a tension. So if you could say a yeah. little bit more about that. I think uh, you're right. Uh, the case tra studies transport that, but if you look at the reasons why people meet in, at conferences to discuss these methods, it's not the problems anymore that are in the foreground, but it's the methods that are in the foreground. And uh, like all the like institutional, the, the attempts towards institutionalization that are undertaken by these actors uh, actually uh, refer to the methods. And that, like in the statements of quite a number of these people, and I, I'm just sorry I didn't show any of these statements, but um, in the statements of many of these people, you can see that they somehow have a very, very like a nostalgic picture of how physics was done during the 1920s, say, when quantum mechanics was developed, that they somehow deplore that during the 50s you have this balkanization of physics and you, that you don't have that anymore. They somehow want to keep the tradition alive. It might very well be an invented tradition. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you. Oliver. First, my congratulations for the wonderful talk. As I had the privilege of listening to uh, one of the first talks you give about this subject, you were touching about the subject. Indeed, I, I 
I revised uh, the Portuguese translation of uh, your talk. I'm really impressed by uh, how deep and how uh, was the the the, uh, the way in which you are presenting uh, your paper. Uh, then it's just a side comment. It's uh, an interaction between two of uh, key studies: uh, nuclear physics and uh, collective variable models. It's just a small anecdote uh, which reveals some kind that sometimes transfer of knowledge also implies some misrepresentation. Uh -huh. uh, in 1956, 57, uh, you probably know uh, David Pines was invited to spend one year, I believe, in Copenhagen, and Bonn uh, applied for spend one month, something like that, and uh, he went to twice. Uh -huh. And Ben Motors and uh, uh, Ogbo were interested in the collective variables uh, uh, approach. And the, apparently this, the discussion was helpful because uh, when you see uh, Ben Motors' uh, Nobel speech, there is a reference to this interaction. But Bon, as he was completely interested in uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, all his recollections of these times uh, were that, the, okay, people in Copenhagen were not inter interested in epistemological lessons. Yep. Then they discussed, but uh, there was no, no uh, real dialogue between them. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, this interaction was very important. I actually spoke to Ben Mottelson about that just two weeks ago. <laughs> um, so um, what they did is actually do an analogy between like uh, the superconducting state and uh, nuclear structure uh, there, and they even published that together. So that, that's quite important. It could have probably been case study seven or eight <laughs> on my list here. And I think you have shown how um, Bohm somehow, after having lost his position in Princeton and went to uh, Brazil, uh, changed its focus towards interpretation of quantum mechanics, also because this was a very quickly developing field and he probably couldn't just keep up uh, with the speed at which this field was developing. And also maybe David Pines drove him a bit out of that, like the last paper, uh, which in a way is still a joint paper of Bohm and Pines, is only by Pines. Uh, and uh, there the, the were some troubles between these two. So I could imagine that the interactions between Bohm and Pines in Copenhagen were probably not that intense. There were rather interactions between Pines and Augebor and Ben Mottelson and between Bohm and Bohr. Okay. But Elise. So uh, following Martin's question, I want to press you on this distinction between centering on methods versus phenomena. Um, and I'm going to wax philosophical here a bit. But... <clears throat> Uh, at the one end of the spectrum, it seems like um, there's, of course, a very obvious and tight link between the sorts of methods one employs and the sorts of phenomena that one um, applies them to. So I don't see where the distinction is important on that end of the spectrum. And then, at the other end of the spectrum, um, if methods is not like robustly understood, then it becomes just mathematical tools. And it's mm -hmm. trivial to say that we were sharing mathematical tools at a certain, like, okay. So can you say a bit more about what, what weight that distinction carries for you? Mm -hmm. And do so in one minute. Okay, yep. I mean, a quick answer would be that, of course, uh, the intellectual rigor that you display is not shared by the actors at the time. So they s speak about it this way. Like, the, the, we're meeting about methods, right? And we're not meeting about specific phenomena. So this is really, like, actor's terminology in a way. Um, but of course, uh, it is true, this, um, is, uh, it, this can only be an approximation to what is really at stake there and in, in, in what's happening there. So in a way, if you look at this reductionist account of physics, you can see that what they do is actually orthogonal to that. It's not like along these monolithic uh, development lines of the subdisciplines of physics, but there, it, it, like gives you like uh, cross links between these developments. And um, it's emphasized by physicists to this day how important these are. And I think their motivation is really that they believe in the unity of physics 
and that this ensures that physics is one science that says something about reality. Um, if you always ensure that like the, the methods used in one and the methods used in another specialty have something to do with one another and get translatable between the two. Okay, um, with apologies to uh, Ariana, Thiago, and Cho, we're going to have to leave it at this. So uh, let's thank, uh, let's just appreciate it.